Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, colleagues, friends, uh, welcome to this um, series of webinar by Society of Emirates Internal Medicine, which is a quite new society, but it's been doing a great job. So it's my privilege and my honor always to be with the friends and the society. And tonight we're going to have something of, uh, I think, uh, interest to everyone, carbometabolic risk factors management in Ramadan. So um, I'm Abdullah Shihab, uh, professor of medicine and uh, intervention cardiologist. So um, it's been always great to be a founder of this uh, society with the money of colleagues uh, and uh, they are running this beautifully and smoothly. So we're gonna discuss um, two topics today. Uh, the first one is about diabetes, hypertension, uh, lipids management during Ramadan. And this is going to be given by Professor uh, Associate Professor Mohammed Hassanin, Senior Consultant Endocrinologist from Dubai Hospital. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Hassanin is a well-known figure in the field of uh, uh, endocrinology and Ramadan, and he's got his uh, society of uh, really looking at this uh, fasting and the effects of fasting and multiple things in life and how to manage um, um, our life during Ramadan regarding uh, medication, lifestyle, many things. So it's great to have him with us today. And um, second topic, uh, the, the presenter not here, but I'll be taking over. So I'll be talking to you about uh, some of the uh, aspects of Ramadan and heart disease and risk factors. And all of you know uh, that Ramadan is the ninth uh, month of, uh, uh, of uh, Hijri uh, uh, month, is lunar month, which is like 11 days, uh, you know, uh, uh, sometimes exceeds, uh, so we have like different season. Ramadan comes in different season. Every um, like 10, 11 years, we get uh, Ramadan in different season. So that's the beauty of Ramadan. So one time in Ramadan, you have it in, in winter, one at, uh, in uh, summer. So this time is going to be kind of, kind of a spring time. So, uh, and it's of one of the pillars. Number uh, the, we have five pillars in, in Islam. It is an important pillar of the of the foundation of, of Islam, and it's uh, compulsory on those who are um, to to fast this certain you know age, puberty, and uh, uh, you know uh, and that certain criteria. We'll discuss this inshallah later on. And there are certain criteria you are exempted from this fasting, and this is uh, similar to other people who maybe heard of intermittent fasting, something similar to that. Uh, but of course, in terms of the fasting, you're allowed to drink. But here, no, you uh, abstain from water, drink, um, uh, all relationship uh, between uh, husbands and wife, all that uh, from, uh, of course, uh, sun uh, uh, before sunrise to sunset. And um, many things changes in this time. Diet changes, uh, physical activity changes. So you know that's all got, uh, of course, impact on the on the on the many things. Among them is cardiovascular. So it's my great pleasure to have uh, this is recorded by Dr. Mohammed Hassanin. Then we'll have a discussion later on uh, to talk to us about uh, diabetes, sleepidemia, hypertension management during Ramadan. So we'll go to that and please write your questions, your comments. I will tackle them together, inshallah, uh, after my talk. So we'll start the presentation. Um, I am Mohammed Hassani, consultant in the Chronology in Dubai Hospital. Thank you very much for the kind invitation for the conference, um, or for the webinar rather, and for the uh, very uh, generous introduction. Um, my task is to discuss the, pro the issues of diabetes in Ramadan where, uh, and how they reflect on blood glucose levels, on blood lipids, and on hypertension. Um, so, Ramadan, of course, as you all know, is a month of fasting, a month of all of us waiting for iftar time, and also a month of lots of spirituality, lots of praying, taraweeh, and many people at least used to go to Umrah. Um, um, so uh, it's a month that is full of passion from all Muslim people across the globe. And at the end of the day, uh, Ramadan also is a month of generosity. Sometimes this generosity can in, in, inadvertently affect a person with diabetes by the reality of um, excessive amount of change in food culture, 
types of food, type of dessert. And in some places as well, we have an open buffet in, uh, in, in many restaurants and hotels that are open all night, which can be a problem for a person with diabetes. We change our habits in eating during Ramadan. All of a sudden, certain drinks become very popular, um, certain types of snacks and, and desserts, and, the, the, and even the snacks in between the meals are often rich in salt or rich in calories and fat. Now, the problem with all of this is for a person with diabetes, the month become from a month of fasting to a month of feasting. That's a serious issue. So that fasting and feasting needs a wake-up call, a wake-up call from all of us. And I'm grateful for the Internal Medicine Society for this event so that we can raise the awareness of all of us and that hopefully would reflect on our people with diabetes. So when we look into glycemic control during Ramadan, we will see lots of um, important information explaining what happens for a person who is healthy. Blood glucose level for a person who is, is healthy, whether they are fasting in gray or non-fasting in, in black, does not change very much. Uh, you see a slight peak after iftar, but it doesn't really change very much because that healthy person has a very sensitive pancreas that produces large amount of insulin to keep the blood glucose levels within this very narrow um, algorithm. However, for a person with um, diabetes, the situation could be different. And this curve is actually of someone who is very well controlled with diabetes, but nevertheless, you see the dip in red in the late afternoon, uh, just before iftar, and then the very big uh, peak after iftar going to a blood glucose level of perhaps uh, here 11 millimoles, which is equivalent to 200 milligrams so per dia. So clearly the, the, the timing of risk of hypo is clear and the timings of postprandial hyperglycemia is also clear. Now, when we look into studies that we have um, published, and this is a systematic review and meta-analysis of the impact of intermittent fasting, such as Ramadan, on the glucose metabolic parameters. And in here, what you see is the plasma serum insulin. And what we see in Ramadan from the various studies, the overall, there's a very slight increase in, so, in, in insulin secretion during the month of Ramadan which perhaps reflects the amount of carbs and, and fatty food that we, that we eat. Now, if you look into the insulin resistance um, in this meta review, you will see that it is considered as very small change for insulin resistance. It doesn't really reflect on so much. That's obviously in um, healthy individuals. The, Parameters, when you look into again insulin sensitivity and anthropometric parameters in healthy young Muslim men, in this particular study, they looked and they found that there is a reduction in body weight and body mass index. The waist circumference um, shows a reduction and the insulin sensitivity improved. But as I showed you from the systematic review, these changes are seen in some studies and other studies there isn't. So overall, there isn't harm there is potential marginal benefit. The situation is different for a person with diabetes. Glycemic control in the vast majority of people with diabetes improves. This is a study that we've done called the Darbina type 2 diabetes trial that took place in the whole of the um, Middle East and North Africa region, including Pakistan. And here we have data for 1,600 persons. And as you can see, HB1C before Ramadan was eight, after Ramadan was 7.5, a change of 0.5%, and that was statistically significant. Fasting plasma glucose also improved by 37.9. Um, however, the uh, postprandial glucose change was less uh, significant, um, not statistically, but it was minus 25 uh, milligram per dl uh, in comparison with the fasting, which perhaps is more important. Now, 
What we also know in, during Ramadan fasting that hypoglycemia increases in relation to the type of therapy. So every single parameter of hypoglycemia increased during the month of Ramadan, even for people who are not on sulfonylurea. Um, here is without sulfonylurea uh, during Ramadan. So uh, it increases as well, it doubles. On sulfonylurea, it more than doubles, and on insulin, it significantly increased. Severe hypoglycemia is rare in type 2 diabetes, but it does occur of 0.9% for patients on sulfonylurea and 1.5% on people on insulin with oral therapy. So the overall of, of the incidence of severe hypoglycemia during Ramadan was just under 1%, which is pretty low. But of course, this is uh, something we should not take lightly. Now, when you look into uh, people with higher risk categories, and this is a study we've done in our hospital, not on the MENA region, just in our Dubai hospital, and we provided everyone with education, with Freestyle Libra, the CGM that you all know, as well as uh, um, patient education and adjustment of the insulin doses. And what we saw here is that the percent of people within target um, improved from 34% to 38%. The percentage of people above target marginally reduced, but the hypoglycemia increased from 3.5% to 5%. And also it confirmed to us that the highest time for hypoglycemia was between midday and iftar time. 12 to 1800 hours, which was the time for iftar at the time in this particular uh, trial. So clearly, we need to be aware of all of this. And also, we need to be aware that many of our patients are not achieving targets as well. So this is in the high risk group. Whom do we mean by high risk group? We mean the patients on insulin, whether type 1 or type 2, there were a group of patients with cardiac, stable cardiac problems or with stable kidney problems or a group with, or, or with gestational diabetes. So I've shown you data for the overall people of diabetes, and now this is data for the high-risk group. This data is much bigger data of nearly um, 5,865 persons that were split into um, a group of them above the age of 65 and the other group below the age of 65. And as you can see, this is a global survey that took place in many countries across Middle East and Asia. And what we see from the data here, the rates of hypoglycemia is 15.6%. Equal to it is rates of hyperglycemia, 16.3%. The vast majority of people, when they get hypo or get hyper, it is usually of one to, one to seven times during the month. But nevertheless, there are some, which you add them here, about 15% get very frequent hypos, and a lot more, 20 38% uh, get frequent hyperglycemia. So what this data is saying to us is, hyperglycemia is a problem that is very much underestimated and is very much prevalent in people with diabetes during the month of Ramadan and out of Ramadan as well. Hypoglycemia, because of the unpleasant effects, it's what makes people remember, but uh, the, the fact of the matter, it is less frequent than hyperglycemia. So when we look into the sensor data, the freestyle Libre data from the um, optimum care study that we did in Dubai, you clearly here see the same what I'm saying up, up to you, that nearly 60% of our patients are above the target. And the target here was above um, 200. So it's very important that we try to make sure that our patients are much more within the target. 
how can we do that? Education is key. And in this beautiful, simple study that was done in Abu Dhabi, in primary care setting, Usama and the colleagues there, um, Usama Mohib and the colleagues there, did a beautiful uh, program of patient education based on the, uh, the guidelines that we published previously. And as you can see here, the frequency of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia in, of hypoglycemia, in, whether in the control group or in the intervention group, before Ramadan was high, 40%. Now, in the intervention group, this reduced to 16.7%. So it is really quite important that we think of patient education because it's a very powerful tool. When we did this work um, in 2007 in UK, at the time I was working in UK, and collaborated with the center in London, and we gave the patient um, education. They were type 2 diabetes on oral therapy. Um, the frequency of hypoglycemia for the education group was nine episodes, but in the control group, it was 36. So four times higher of prevalence of hypoglycemia in those who did not have education. That work gave us the first prize award from Diabetes UK, in 2008, from the European Association in 2008, and for the sustainability of the effect on weight and H1C for 2009 from Diabetes UK as well. So clearly education work and education is in a systematic review. This systematic review we published um, just two years ago shows the impact of the patient education on important parameters. And here, this was on hypoglycemia. So overall, the vast majority for every single study we know has improved hypoglycemic episodes. So this is really quite important because glycemic control um, is a very much the outcome of the balance between hypo and good control. And we need to get good control without hypoglycemia. So again, I show you the data from the Optimum Care uh, study um, that we've done. And I would like to just highlight to you that two points, hypoglycemia increases doubles. And particularly, as I mentioned earlier, at the late afternoon to evening time. So how can we, beyond education, improve on this matter? Very much it's important to think of what we eat in Suhoor. If we think simple and we say, at Suhoor, I need to stuff myself with sugar, then it will go up quickly and disappears quickly. If I take low glycemic index carbs, it, the peak will be a bit less, but after three hours, it's gone. So it's important to think of protein and simple fats, such as olive oil or fat in dairy products, because protein with small amount of fat will not cause a peak in the blood glucose levels and will last a lot longer. And that's really quite important for all of us to remember when advising our patients about one, the importance of suhoor, second, suhoor to be as late as possible, and third, the component of the food that we eat in suhoor. So having eggs, having beans, having cheese, having dairy products, Having fish or chicken at suhoor time is very, very good. Having some um, fiber from vegetables and fruits is also good. Having juice or jam or sweets at suhoor is not advisable. It will just, for a person with diabetes, increase the blood sugar levels and then will disappear quickly. What about, about the effect of fasting Ramadan on blood pressure? Well, we looked into this in, in some of the studies. And as you can see here, in some of the studies, it shows excellent improvement uh, for blood pressure in people with hypertension. So this is a study that looked into hypertensive middle-aged men um, and women, and they looked into the blood pressure. And as you can see here, 15 millimeters mercury systolic was reduced and nine in diastolic. And this study was published uh, um, into 2014, so about seven, eight years ago. Um, 
there's a far number of, of, of studies for systematic reviews, which all looked into the effect of hypertension. And for the vast majority of the studies, there is significant reduction in blood pressure. Not in all of them. Some of them, it did not go, it did not, was not reduced. In some, it was slightly, only slightly lower, but in others, it was significantly improved. So perhaps this is relation not just to the effect of fasting, but the lifestyle of the individual in the study during fasting. When you look into this other study done um, in, from uh, 2017 in Saudi Arabia, you can see a very decent reduction of, of systolic blood pressure of 11 millimeters mercury, which was also physically significant. In our study of the Darmina, we saw small reduction of three millimeters mercury systolic and marginal reduction in diastolic, which was not really clinically or even statistically significant at all. In our optimum care trial, we did not, this is, mind you, this is the high risk patients, the patients with long duration of diabetes on insulin, or maybe some of them were cardiac, some of them were renal patients. So we did not see a change in um, systolic blood pressure. For glycemic control, I've told you before that was 0.3% reduction in glycemic control. So what about the treatment for hypertension? What should we do with it during the month of Ramadan? Well, I think it's easy. In one daily, it could be taken iftar or suhoor. It depends on what type of therapy it is. Twice daily than iftar and suhoor. Diuretics, many of course, patients with, with high treatment with hypertension are on um, diuretics that, such as thiazide lights or non thiazide light diuretics. Um, and this ideally need to be avoided during the fasting hours to avoid excessive thirst. So it's a balance between what time is the iftar, what time the patient will go to bed, and a balance of giving the right dose. Now, for people on high dose of diuretics, perhaps we need to review whether they are fit to fast or not, and the dose need to be reduced. We know that in some cases in Ramadan, many people eat salty food, excessive salty food, such as pickles and salted nuts and so forth. And for a diabetic person with hypertension, that perhaps needs to be seriously reviewed. What about lipids management or lipids profile during the month of Ramadan? Well, in vast majority of trials, there was no significant reduction. It either were stable or it went up slightly. In some studies, it went down, but these were the minority of studies. Um, here in this particular study, which um, was published in 2019, they looked into the lipid parameters and there was no significant effect on um, triglycerides and total cholesterol for LDL. And there was a marginal increase in LDL, but that was not really quite significant. In our MENA trial, we saw um, some um, re marginal reduction of LDL, um, of triglycerides and of total cholesterol, but in fairness, while they're statistically significant, clinically, they were very marginal. Now, when we look into our optimum care trial for the high-risk patients that we looked at in, in Dubai Hospital, the total cholesterol, the triglycerides, and the LDL all went up, which is we do not want. And in some of these occasions, such as the triglycerides, the increase was particularly uh, worrying, which reflects the glycemic control that I told you was not that good in this group of patients. HDL uh, hardly did not change. But I would like to remind you that all of these trials had a pattern of measuring before Ramadan and after Ramadan. And after Ramadan, frequently it's a month or two after Ramadan. So in none of these trials, we were certain what happens during Ramadan in comparison to what it was before and after. And in this particular trial, which we did in Dubai Health Authority, it was more of the more simple. The vast majority of patients were from primary care. And what we did, we looked into 
the people who came to our clinic during the last 10 days of Ramadan. And of course, because we have electronic records, we looked into similar data for them before Ramadan, and we asked them to repeat the same tests after Ramadan. So here we have a design that can, for the first time in people with diabetes, we have data on during the last 10 days of Ramadan, where we can say the effect of the fasting has taken its toll on the individual with diabetes. And what we saw, as you can see from this graph, is there is marginal improvement in the vast majority of the parameters during Ramadan. But unfortunately, it goes back after Ramadan. So look into weight. There's a loss of roughly 1.6 kilograms, but then goes back to after Ramadan to what it was. BMI follows the same. Systolic blood pressure, um, drop of two millimeters mercury was sustained for uh, after Ramadan as well. Diastolic blood pressure, a slight reduction, and the, the effect was sustained. HB1C dropped marginally and then went back to post-Ramadan uh, to what it was before Ramadan. Lipid profile had a cholesterol, had an increased triglyceride, had an increased um, uh, LDL also had an increase during Ramadan, and that increase was also there afterwards. So renal function, which is very important, very marginally changed from 102 to, nine, to almost 100, and then went back to the same level. So does renal function get impaired during Ramadan? The answer is no. Two mils per minute per square meter at EGFR is of no clinical significance, and it went back to its normal level. But for the other biometric, and here is the change. So as you can see, for HB1C, for weight, and for blood pressure, there is marginal improvements that we cannot really call it sig clinically significant. For lipids, there is slight worsening, but also I wouldn't say it's clinically significant. And for EG for creatinine, it was no effect, and for EGFR, it was minus 2.6, which improved afterwards. So in summary, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to summarize between the three big trials that we have seen of recent uh, scale, the optimum care study in yellow, the Darvina in green, and the ABCD trial, which looked into during Ramadan. And as you can see, there is almost a pattern for most of the studies. Of course, some of the studies are from different cohorts. So the ABCD, the blue and the yellow are from the same cohort, which is Dubai. The MENA is as by virtue of its name, is clear. And for the vast majority, there is no significant differences uh, between one and the other. Some marginal improvements in glycemic control, in weight, in blood pressure, and some minor worsening in lipids profile, and no significant impact on creatinine and liver and, and, and renal function. So the answer for all of this is what Tony Blair, Tony Blair the ex-Prime Minister of the UK said, education, education, education. I've shown you that education can do a lot of good. And perhaps if we can change the culture from the bad eating habits and go back to the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where his hadith advised people to have a third of the stomach for food, a third for fluids, and a third to breathe. If this is applied, then I am certain, similar to some of the studies that we saw significant improvements, this will be sustained. So education and going back to our basic religion and culture, Ramadan after all is not a month of feasting, it's a month of fasting. May Allah accept all our good deeds and Ramadan Kareem, and um, hopefully we will enjoy the webinar. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassanin. He will be with us at the end, inshallah. So many things being raised in this topic and uh, I think beautifully discussed with evidence, with the studies. So um, 
What I will do uh, this few minutes, I uh, will not take as time as Dr. Hassanin, so we can have more time for discussion. So <clears throat> um, this is my disclosure. You know, these are the people who are exempted from uh, uh, fasting, uh, people who are you know, uh, traveling, uh, ill people, um, people who have you know, uh, children, of course, and puberty and pregnant. These are exempted, but you know, in our uh, culture, people uh, you know, they're, they're waiting for this month and they want to do their best and to fast it. And uh, you know, um, we know the, the leading cause of death in the world is cardiovascular disease. And uh, is it different in Ramadan than other? You know, it's very difficult to say this. We had many registries done in the in the, in the Gulf and uh, looking at the seven countries in the in, in the region. It's difficult to say, to be honest with you. I mean, it's um, sometimes you say yes, sometimes say it's neutral, sometimes say it's lower, but it's not fasting itself because you cannot. Um, you know, whatever statistics uh, we do, we cannot really just looking because at the end of the day, they may retrospective, it's not really focusing on fasting itself. So uh, as you heard from Dr. Hassanin, there are many reasons uh, for uh, hypertension get worse, for lipid get worse. It's, it's diet itself. It's the way we are changing our uh, timing, uh, activities, and many reasons. So just uh, to say that you know, kind of remain the, the, the problem. And we did in our region, we did a study looking at all the risk factors in the region. And uh, we are compared to the world, we are two times or three times higher in our prevalence of cardiovascular disease. Imagine if in the world they say four, four percentage, we are almost like 10, as I said here, 10.1 percentage higher. So, and the reason for that, already discussed by Dr. Hassanin, we are leading the world in terms of dyslipidemia. So we have higher, you know, uh, one in two of us, and maybe in UAE and the Middle East have got dyslipidemia. That means bad cholesterol. Uh, one in three got high blood pressure. One in four, one in five got diabetes. And there are many reasons for diabetes, of course, you know, it's the, the lifestyle, obesity is prevalence, you know, uh, and especially in, with the COVID, I think everyone got you know, overweight and, and obese. So many reasons for it. And it's changing in UAE as well. You can see we are leading the world in terms of um, cardio. So the, these are all the risk factors, you know, although we maybe the topic, we can just focus on lipids, but these all risk factors contribute to the um, uh, cardiovascular events. As cardiovascular events means a stroke, heart attack, and then peripheral vascular diseases. So any of these contribute to this. So if you want to discuss hypertension, doesn't mean you, you forget about others. And this is apply whether you are fasting, not fasting. But of course, fasting is changing the time of taking medication, time of sleeping, and time of the diet. But it should not, you know, I don't think would be any change in terms of, but the fasting, of course, the benefit of fasting itself, when you just look at that, from intermittent fasting, which is discussed by Dr. Hassanin, uh, which is different than our fasting. As, uh, you know, our fasting, we ask, abstain from everything, you know, uh, from uh, sun uh, rise to sunset. And um, compared to the, uh, the intermittent fasting where they allowed uh, fluid, allowed uh, tea and all that. And, and they found a lot of benefit from this itself. So uh, in terms of dyslipidemia, of course, we just focus on this um, because it's the leading uh, risk factors similar to the hypertension in terms of cardiovascular disease. And uh, how can we manage this during Ramadan, I think would be the same, but we should not forget that guidelines is changing. I think all of you are aware, if you speak about guidelines of diabetes, guidelines of hypertension, guidelines of dyslipidemia, smoking, anything is changing. The reason for that is we're getting more information based on randomized clinical trial. In the past, we used to have information based on observation, but now we get more. So the more data you have from randomized clinical trial, you know, make refining your, your where the best level of LDL to be to get the benefit. So um, at the moment, anything below uh, for very high risk, below 1.1 uh, 1. 1 is great. That means around 40. So uh, we have a new guidelines, of course, you've seen about the dyslipidemia, that LDL, you know, this is when you measure LDL, it should be your um, causal kind of uh, association with the cardiovascular outcome. So if you want to tackle something, you tackle LDL. 
And then comes the other things like uh, triglycerides and, 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 and so on and so on. People talk, I don't know, every time I go to any meeting, the people talk about triglycerides, but triglycerides should be less second, third, LDL should be your first. And how to manage LDL, it's, it's been a big debate because we have a great medication available for a long time, statin family. And um, if, you, if it's done in a proper way, then you get a good, good, uh, good result. But unfortunately, we are not uh, patient not adherent to the medication and uh, or patient not getting enough information from the doctor. So one of the things you know, we should do, whether in Ramadan or not Ramadan, is to educate our patients, as Dr. Hassanian said, about the importance of this medication, especially, especially if the patient already had event. Somebody had a stroke, somebody had a heart attack, somebody is or vascular diseases or very high risk diabetes. And this patient should really know, understand the importance of lowering their LDL because that's contribute uh, significantly to their um, uh, outcome. So we have a statin, then we have another medication like ezetimibe. This medication works at the and uh, in a bowel at the area to uh, reduce the absorption. So these two together reduce uh, uh, the LDL uh, around 60 percentage. Then of course, those who are not reaching the target depends if the patient is, um, uh, you know, I'm giving you an example here of somebody with very high risk, that means patient got familial hyperlipidemia, somebody had an event and somebody having more events. So these are having different target. If you speak about the, what LDL, Somebody primary prevention to secondary prevention should be different based on risk factors, not based on just uh, from, from you know, any, uh, uh, memories, okay? Based on risk factors. So example here, I mean, this patient uh, from registry we had in, in, in the Gulf, uh, just in one example here. So patient is in his fifties, um, coming to the ER, complaining of, I mean, we had many of these during Ramadan, especially after, you know, between, uh, Futur and suhur, that means between the uh, breaking their fast and and, and then uh, and fasting. So this this type where the you know things changes. You know people when they break their fast, they break you know maybe with a lot of uh, calories, uh, carbohydrate. You know and uh, and um, they're just so hungry that to the extent that you know they just consume everything and maybe in, in, in ten minutes <laughs> things which should take you like one hour take you ten minutes. And that's, of course, got an adverse effect on the patient already got like heart failure, got uh, already MI in the past. So this patient uh, came to a ER with a non-diabetic hypertensive. So if you are diabetic hypertensive, be careful uh, with your diet. Be careful how you manage your medication during Ramadan. Uh, so this patient basically end up having um, um, stunted their uh, uh, arteries. But again, patient, uh, this kind of medication, which is high dose, you know, they have side effects, especially on Ramadan. So this, I graph, I use it because uh, when they called, um, you have an MI, doesn't mean if you treat it, um, you are uh, stable, you know, you remain unstable or stable based on risk factors. If you control your diabetes, if you control your hypertension, control your dyslipidemia, control your uh, lifestyle, smoking, all that, then you can say is your lower risk. You cannot say stable or high risk. Okay. So always any patient come to us, we look at their risk factors. Okay. Where are they in the term of the target to know? Because this is called a syndrome nowadays. Now, somebody with chronic artery disease, we used to call it a stable angina, not anymore. It's called chronic coronary syndrome. Syndrome means you could be here, stay any low risk, you could be high risk. So it depends on your risk factors. This is a very important graph. Uh, if you are a endocrinologist, cardiologist, physician, learning now about dyslipidemia, you should know any time we say somebody is very high risk, we need to look at the, is the patient established risk, you know, events like had a stroke, had MI, all that. And then based on that, we say, okay, your level should be you know, 55 or lower. If you have another event, somebody like had a heart attack now, come again, that means their LDL should be lower. Um, so this is, as I mentioned, uh, normally when it comes to management of uh, sleep edema, like any other risk factors, you start with lifestyle, you start with the statin, then add to statin the, the estomid, and then you go to something like PCSK9, which is expensive medication and not available at the time. 
Like any other risk factors, dyslipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, you've seen nowadays, we don't use only one medication. We use multiple medication with synergistic effect. So you can get the results with less side effects. And uh, this is the problem everywhere. You know, if you're speaking about anything in life nowadays, you come to the medication adherence. Uh, adherence in a, a year for any patient is less than 50%. So somebody to stay on medication for a year, you know, most 50% will not stay on there. So that's the, if they are, if they are with education. Without education, Allah alam, and it may be reaching 8%. So it's very important to educate, to, to, especially in Ramadan, people, you know, um, they want to fast, especially if they are having acute coronary syndrome, especially if they had heart failure, despite they are exempted, and despite that we tell them, you know, you're having acute coronary syndrome, you have heart failure, you are unstable, not to fast, but they fast. So if they want to fast, then we have to have a better education. And that's, you know, uh, is to, to, to be watch their diet, especially when they break their fast and watch their temper, uh, watch their activities during uh, the, where they feast, as Dr. Hassan said. <laughs> okay, this is very important not to, you know, to make it in a small intervals rather than just a big uh, 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 yani, uh, meag at, at one time. This is the problem, as I said, you know, guidelines changing. We are re not reaching the guidelines because the guidelines changing. And in our region, um, uh, we did this studies and we found in our region, people with dyslipidemia, um, uh, those with a high risk, only one third of them reached the target. That's of course, based on the uh, old guidelines. New guidelines from Allah, I think it's much, much, much worse. Uh, but of course the primary prevention better than that. And this tells you exactly, look, 2016 compared to 19. It's worse, everything is worse. Why? Because the guideline changed. And, um, and, and this is not easy. So when you come to consideration, a reason for lipids, this is applied to anything. Although Dr. Hassani mentioned diabetes, mentioned hypertension. So we need to apply this to anything. So when you come to ask reason for adherence, there are many reasons. So this is maybe the choice you've, you've, you've selected for your patient, got lots, lots of side effects. So try to look at that. Maybe patient is able to afford it. Maybe patient is polypharmacy. Maybe patient is, you know, a cognitive problem. There are many reasons. So we need to look at that, not just a patient not taking medication. We need to look into that. So you treat problem from the root. Okay. Um, so this is uh, the, the adherence, of course, is very bad. If you are not adherent to your medication for your uh, post-MI, stem thrombosis, uh, another heart attack. Uh, then complication, heart failure. Then if you're not adherent to the heart failure medication, worsening heart failure, advanced heart failure. So it's very important education about the adherence uh, to these medications. So um, um, uh, I think, uh, you know, just coming about speaking about the reason for uh, non-adherence, uh, all this. So ideally, of course, any medication, uh, either for diabetes, for hypertension, the sleeping, you need to be tolerable, efficacious, high adherence, and uh, minimal cost. But of course, it's very difficult to find that kind of medication. And we have problem nowadays, and we have to admit this. Statin is great medication, but got some side effects. And these side effects should be beautifully, nicely discussed with patient. Otherwise, you will get information from the, uh, you know, from, from the media, those who are uh, uh, spreading wrong and the policy uh, information about the statin, because they talk about their ideas rather than just evidence from randomized clinical trial. They say this and that based on what? I don't know. They, they try to, um, you know, play with the, with the way they present things. And people, you know, most of the people don't look at the studies, just listen to somebody say something and they take it. So it's very important to we spread the, the proper knowledge, people understand it and adherence. Very, so this is a study we did in our region here and uh, we looked at the, all the patients uh, came with acute coronary syndrome. This was including during Ramadan as well. Um, uh, no, no, no much difference between the people had uh, MI before or after uh, or during Ramadan. Uh, although, as I said, you know, it, it varies, depends on uh, from what region. If you are looking at the during the summer because of the dehydration, many reasons, maybe that times uh, contribute to this. Uh, if you do it in the cold area, that varies. So it's not, not that easy to talk about. But anyway, I'm just focusing on dyslipidemia. So dyslipidemia, people who had a heart, um, heart attack, their uh, LDL were around 80, 80 something, okay? And in six month follow up, it went down to 70. So it's not much difference. We're supposed to go from 80 down to 35, at least 40% or 50% reduction, but not happening. Why? 
because we as a physician um, not done our uh, job properly on education, either in CCU or in the follow up with the patients. We just sometimes copy and paste, and which is, and I, I like to blame ourselves rather than blame others because we can change what we do. We cannot change other people's behavior. Okay, if we do our things, it will be a great position. Same apply with the statin therapy, uh, which um, we also did the study and look at this is a very uh, simple uh, lipid lowering. And uh, we were actually the first to do this multi-center study in the, in, the, in the region. And this very, you can say, moderate statin medication, uh, we get a good result, almost like 50% reduction. So basically what, the message from here is that even a statin with this um, uh, potency, which is moderate, you're able to get to the target if you, you know, combine that with education. You cannot just depend on medication itself. You see, one thing I have learned that randomized clinical trial is great because it's taken the placebo away. But now we as a physician, we have this placebo with us. So we can educate, we can give more, so patient trust us, trust the medication. So you get, you get you know, more uh, benefit from the, uh, from, the, um, from the medication itself. These are kind of patient we see in, you know, patient with heart attack, but they have multiple, uh, lesion like this. We cannot just leave it for a stent to do the job. We need to do lifestyle, especially if they're smoking. Smoking is a big, big, big problem in the region. And every, nowadays, everyone I see in the, in the cat lab, smoking. And you talk to them, you know, what are you waiting for? When are you going to stop? They say to you, inshallah, doctor, it's difficult. But now they had a heart attack. Of course, it's not, it's not anymore. They have to wait any, another for her, another heart attack because second heart attack is fatal. So uh, basically, uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, to leave you with this, uh, whether we're in Ramadan or not in Ramadan, is not to listen to our patients and uh, guide our patients, support our patients, motivate them, and uh, involve them in the, in, the, in, the, in the management, because that should be our way. And uh, together, I think we can, we can reach. So when it comes to cardiovascular disease for lipids, it's not only, one, only LDL, it's inflammatory, it's thrombotic, it's many things and what contributing to this. So uh, people not to fast and to fast just to re, uh, just to uh, a reminder for all of us. Those who can, we can say you can fast is stable. Uh, the one I said you can, you know, with the lowest factors, asymptomatic. Um, you know, uh, the people you can adjust their doses of medication and you can have a long acting, but not somebody with acute coronary syndrome or complication or the recent intervention or uh, or bypass. Although we can individualize this, but in general, we cannot do this. Okay, same apply to the hypertension who are resistant, um, difficult to control, and they need uh, a frequent uh, intervention in terms of medication. And same apply to, of course, the heart failure who are not stable. And, um, and uh, I think I'll stop here. It was just kind of everything. <laughs> And, and this, because as I said, I was trying to replace somebody else's uh, talk today, but I hope it was uh, fine. So now I think we'll uh, try to open and close here. If I see any questions now from our colleagues, I didn't get any questions here, but anyway, um, I'm waiting for any help guys, any questions. If Dr. Mohammed Hassan in here would be great as well to uh, involve him in some questions. Dr. Mohammed Hassan, you are here? Oh, inshallah, he's here. <laughs> So, Dr. Mohammed Hassanin, thank you very much. I'm, I'm here with you. I'm uh, I'm here with you in clinic, and great. Thank you very much to be with thank us. Thank you very and, much. Uh, As you I, can see, Dr. Uh, we enjoyed your talk. You uh, basically covered all uh, uh, questions and uh, things goes in our mind. So we uh, at the moment, you know, I, I gave also a talk about the general cardiac aspects and what's happened and how to manage our patients during uh, Ramadan, which should not be different, but there's only the timing is different. It's just to, as you said, you need to uh, watch our diet and watch our way we sleep and, and tract, you know, just timing of the medication you take in the morning, you can make it with the futur and the one you take in the, at night, take it with the suhoor, something like that. But again, you know, should um, adjust our life in a way that we don't increase the burden, especially with the patients with the unstable risk like hypertension, heart failure, and so on. So, doctor, uh, in, exactly. in, in, in diabetes, um, and you know, uh, almost like eighty percent of my patients are diabetic, and uh, some of them are already right. on insulin um, 
you know, uh, regimen, and some of them are, and and a day, uh, one day, once a day, this long acting one, and some of them with these uh, small doses of. Uh, so how you how I mean they insist. They say, doctor, I want to fast. If you if you don't, I go to another doctor. <laughs> so, but what's your advice? Yes. How can you tailor that patient? Uh, uh, physician listening to us now. Sure. So, for of course, we need to try as much as possible to convince them in a nice way about the level of risk. If the level of risk is very high, that's a duty we have to explain to them. If it's moderate or low and they insist on fasting, then there should be no major issue provided they would listen to the advice. So, the first advice, of course, is for them that they need to check on a regular basis to know where they are and if there is a risk of going hypo to predict it and prevent it. As for the insulin, the long acting insulin, uh, most of the, or some of them are ultra long acting. So the timing for them doesn't matter, uh, which sim similar to the, the Tresiva, for example, uh, and to the to, uh, Glargine 300. But the Lantus, which many people would use, it's about 20 hours duration. So if you give it at iftar time, it will be running out between Asr and Maghrib. So the time that the patient is vulnerable, that would be good that they will have very little insulin running. So that's why we advise to give the Lantus at iftar time. For the short acting insulin, they take it at the meal time. And we adjust the dose according to the size of the meal. So big iftar, big dose. For suhoor, as they will be fasting anyhow, we advise to reduce the dose. For long-acting insulin, should we reduce the dose or not? It depends on their baseline HB1C. For people who are reasonably controlled, HB1C below 8, then I will reduce the dose by 25 to 30%. For people who are poorly controlled, then we just keep it as it is, and hopefully with the fasting, it will get better. Yeah, excellent. I think these are very important points, especially I, I was not aware about the lantuses and glargine. That's, that's great because I have many patients in this. Uh, and so that's helped me tomorrow when, I, when I, people come to me and say, doctor, what should we do? With they were starting from today actually asking me, doctor, Ramadan is coming. What should we do? I say, okay, wait, wait. <laughs> everything tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, doctor, what about the, you know, the, the new medication in the field of diabetes, which is also in our field in cardiology as well? SGLT2 and GLP1. Uh, what about these medications and diabetes? How should we, yep. uh, what are our advice to our patient and physicians? Sure. They are very important drugs to be taken because of their cardiac and renal protection. Yeah. So if the patient is already on them, um, with GLP1, whether it's daily or weekly, doesn't really matter. No problem. They take it at the normal time. If it's daily, they take it at their star. Weekly, they can take it whenever they want. For SDL2 inhibitors, they should take it at iftar time, and they should make sure to drink plenty of fluids during the fasting hours. But for both, if the patient is not already on them, I would not initiate them during Ramadan because of the side effects. One, make you feel a bit thirsty and possibly with hypertension at the time of initiation, which is the SGL2, and the GLP1s have side effects with gastrointestinal. And these are issues I would like to avoid in Ramadan. If you're desperate, then start with a very slow dose. Right, we have a question here, uh, thanking you, doctor, and thanking myself and saying, according to the one of the studies in your lecture, most hypoglycemic events happens a few hours before iftar. Uh, do you think Correct. changing the doses to long acting, okay, in sahur, time will decrease the risk of hypoglycemic. I think you've answered this. Maybe you want to maybe uh, asking about changing the yeah. timing of to the sahur and instead of, I don't know. What yes. do you think? <laughs> so, so to repeat again, to change the, ins the long acting insulin to a start time, as the insulin will not be covering 24 hours, then okay. the time, the void of insulin will be between Asr and Maghrib, and that will be the logic thing to do. But if the insulin is ultra long acting, then changing the timing doesn't matter. It, it's reducing the dose. And uh, will you change any medication which contains uh, thiazide or loop for, for patient with hypertension? <laughs> because you mentioned hypertension today. No, no. I mean, uh, if, if I, I mentioned that in my conclusion. 
So a patient who's taking an antihypertensive that includes a FASA diuretic, I would advise them to take it at the iftar okay. so that they can exert the diuresis at the sort of awake time. And as you know, the vast majority of our patients are up all night and asleep yeah. all day. So that wouldn't be a, a major issue for them. What about anything? Any, uh, I mean, diet is, is, is a big problem in Ramadan. It's varieties there, you know, things which you've never seen in, during 11 months. We see it in Ramadan. I mean, what's, uh, what do you suggest or what do you advise to us all? I mean, not only diabetic. <laughs> Modesty. Yes. I mean, of course, I mean, uh, Ramadan all of a sudden becomes a month of feasting rather than a month of fasting. Yeah. So we, we end up with drinks that we don't have every meal like the vento and the lights, um, too many sugar and carb and fat content containing food. So small amounts. So don't say no, but try to be modest with the quantity. Um, and for dessert, it should not be for a person with diabetes on a daily basis. It should be perhaps um, once or twice a week and small amounts, small portions. Think of the French cuisine of desserts rather than the big <laughs> pieces of kunafa that we have. Beautiful, mashallah. I mean, that's that's the thing, you know, a lot of sweet, Dr. Hussain, and it, I don't know people any year. I, I mean, any study there that during Ramadan, I mean, because of this um, wrong behavior in terms of diets is caused, they become, you know, uh, you know, they get, of course, the weight increase, you know, the insulin resistant get, I mean, it's everything happened. Any studies showed that during Ramadan, people get uh, all these diabetes <laughs> because of the behavior or... And, uh, well, well the, the, the interesting thing is, although, I mean, we've done a lot of studies in our patients and from the region and from other similar Middle Eastern countries where the food is pretty bad in Ramadan, but luckily, we are fasting for 15 hours. So it balances itself out. So what we see in weight is a marginal uh, uh, reduction or stable. Um, in the past, we used to say 25% gain weight, 25% lose weight, and 50% have no weight change. So overall, the weight doesn't change very much because um, we end up overindulging for a few hours and then fasting for 15 hours, it balances itself out. Right. Well, I think it's been great uh, night, uh, and uh, I know you are. <laughs> you've been in the clinic, and we got you with us. Uh, and I'm um, still in clinic, actually. Still in clinic. Uh, I think we have another one question. I think just finish this one. Say for obese patients, not diabetic, can we add Ozempic before Ramadan by one, two weeks? Any recommendations? I mean, this is a um, Ozempic um, when we initiate it. Um, patients might feel a bit of gastrointestinal symptoms. So if you're desperate to initiate, um, you initiate normally with a quarter of a milligram, um, and then you increase on a monthly basis. If your patient gets symptoms, then certainly you will need to um, consider stopping. But the problem with the Zempic, it's a weekly injection. So if you have an injection just a few days before Ramadan and you end up with a lot of nausea and these symptoms, which sometimes happen in the initiation time, then you had it for the week. You have no choice. And that's why I would say I'd rather delay the initiation until after Ramadan. Otherwise, try a very small dose and warn the patient. Yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is a, I mean, I, I call it a revolution in the field of uh, obesity and diabetes uh, with this medication. I, I tried some patients on this Ozempic and... Um, you know, even during, um, uh, you know, nowadays, pe people get some side effects and they get side effects. Some of them are very bad. It's side yeah. GI symptoms continue for some time. You don't want patient to blame you <laughs> for fasting, for, you know, not fasting Ramadan. So I, I agree with Dr. Hassan. This medication is great, but be careful not to, you know, um, started before Ramadan. So there's a question, I think, final question, doctor, to all of us. Uh, asking Dr. Shihab a few remarks words on dieting and exercising during Holy of Ramadan. As you know, mostly uh, elderly um, uh, with comorbidities tend to walk 45 minutes, 30 minutes before iftar time and before suhoor time. Any few words regarding that its effect on decreasing HB1C and hypertension 
uh, numbers. Uh, you know, the most, I think, Dr. Senin, I think this is maybe a last question uh, for me and you. It's any uh, um, recommendation, because we have people in Ramadan, yeah. they like to, to walk and do exercise before iftar. And some of them, of course, they do it uh, before suhoor. Um, so uh, do, do you think that has any of this got effect on HB1C and, uh, and hypertension and dyslipidemia? Um, I, I want to listen to you, then I'll say my words. We, we, we encourage activity in Ramadan. Um, Ramadan should not be a month of sleeping and watching TV. Um, so the timing of the exercise depends on the type of therapy and the control of the person. So someone who's on insulin, we then we advise them to do the exercise in, after, in the eating hours. So before sahur is perfect. But before iftar, if they're on insulin or sulfonylurea, then it needs to be a very light type of exercise. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. Go ahead, Dr. I need to go because there's a patient yes. waiting for okay. me. I'm, I'm, I've been so, waiting for I, some time. Thank you very much for your help, Dr. Senin. Inshallah, we'll see you on another. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, with regarding the thank you. So, with regarding to uh, guys, to the the question I got, I'd like to also answer. You know, very important to understand losing weight. It's 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 a combination, but mainly diet. It's mainly diet. Exercise is nice to be there to tune your body to feel better, feel relaxed. But diet is very important, you know, um, and, uh, and, and watch your diet <laughs> because you don't want to put on weight during Ramadan. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I know food is beautiful, nice, uh, all the things there. But if, if you have, if the, anybody in the family got heart problem, like, you know, already had acute coronary syndrome, heart failure, and bypass, arrhythmias, and not controlled, you know, they should not fast, if, preferably. If they want to fast, then they have to, you know, follow some guides, you know listen to the doctor, I mean, I try not, you know, I do my best not to say to the patient, not fast, but if they want to listen to fast, then they have to take my um, suggestion. They need to watch their diet, the way they sleep, the way they think, the, the medication, how to take them. They should be comply with this one. So I could, you know, help them with the, with the, with the fasting. Otherwise, you know, fasting has become a burden on the patient. And this, what a, don't don't يعني, uh, hurt yourself because of you want to fulfill something a pillar of islam but you are exempted from it if you are ill and even if you are ill you are not you know you are exempted imagine if you are unstable of course you should not but for general people during ramadan i suggest you know diet try to be as you know as divide them not to take everything in one go especially with the with with the, with the buffet nowadays huh? you will hear every day uh, uh, people advertising about different diet different meal different sweet it's nice but be careful um, uh, to to you know um, not to indulge in this uh, heavy meal once once a week okay <laughs> if you are healthy huh? but again uh, try to do that before you sleep you know, some people have a big meal and go to sleep. It's just like a, you are, it's like a bomb, you know, you might, <laughs> you cannot sleep. And then in addition to that, you might have, uh, you know, a bad uh, attack during the night. And that happens. People with um, uh, nowadays, uh, because of the stress going on with a bit of uh, heavy meal uh, and uh, smoking with a coffee, black coffee, mashallah, and nothing remain. I end up in my cath lab. So uh, it's been a great night and um, uh, being with you guys and uh, really uh, I enjoyed uh, the interaction with you. And uh, Ramadan is uh, a pillar of Islam and uh, I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, the, the, the fasting, uh, the ritual of Ramadan, the blessing of Ramadan and uh, worship. Uh, don't forget, <laughs> everything is worship during Ramadan, inshallah. And um, uh, yani try to be nice to, to each other, uh, not to get uh, yani, uh, upset because, you know, some people are smokers during the Ramadan, they can't smoke, they get, they put all their uh, things on the, their, their friends or their wife or, or wife and the husband. And be careful about that. 
So uh, hopefully things have been great and uh, inshallah كل عام وانتم بخير ورمضان مبارك قريبا uh, we'll see you inshallah and thank ICOM for arranging this meeting uh, for Internal Medicine Society Emirates uh, my pleasure being with you and Dr. Hassanin until next time inshallah uh, all the best Assalamu alaikum